the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation. Traditionally, when we think about freedom, freedom has a negative aspect, which is freedom from something, and freedom to, which is a positive conception of freedom, where you do something. And anarchism emerged out of a republican way of viewing those two things. And the, the negative side of it was freedom from slavery. But then the freedom to uh, took on a very unique perspective in anarchist thought. Right? So where um, republicans were of the view that liberal bourgeois states could release us from freedoms and provide us with a positive framework for realising the good life, anarchists thought that the state and private property in particular uh, could not. And so they looked to communal, directly democratic, participatory, anti-capitalist uh, modes of organising and living as alternatives to <coughs> conceptions of politics that were predominantly about states and capitalism. So I think it's also quite helpful to think about the relationship um, between anarchism and republicanism and non-domination and, and constitutionalism by thinking about some of the historical events that that were key to to the, to the, the sort of the crystallisation of anarchism. One of which was the the Paris Commune in eighteen seventy one, which comes just at the moment that the uh, the International Workers Association is is collapsing. And the other is the Haymarket Affair of 1887 in America. And, and what's what the common link, if you like, between these two things is the idea that the values of republicanism, the values of the revolution from the, the 18th century of liberty, equality, fraternity, had been exposed through the failure of the republican constitutions to uphold popular will. So mm -hmm. what you have in the Paris Commune is actually um, an instance where a popular rebellion... Uh, is used as uh, a vehicle to uh, initiate a massacre, the biggest massacre in Europe of the 19th century, where 20,000 people at a conservative estimate are killed. And what you have in America is uh, the testing of, 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 of actually, you know, people who have come out of a civil war experience where they feel that they've been legitimately fighting a war that, that's supposed to end slavery, and then finding that the uh, employers are turning private militias on workers who are fighting against exploitation, and they're still enslaved. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this, this massive disappointment that causes anarchists, I think, particularly to think about, well, what does it mean to self-govern? And one of the things it means is to reject the existing constitutions, which uphold inequality and which uh, perpetuate exploitation. It's probably, it's probably worth mentioning that you know, there has been an anti-authoritarian, sort of a libertarian with a small L or a small A anarchist impulse in most cultures. Where anarchism meets these indigenous impulses, they take on very particular mm. flavours. So the, the experiences that Ruth is describing are very particular to a sort of a, a white European experience. Um, and then, of course, in the United States, it takes on its own hue. But there, the, these impulses manifest in different ways around the world. And we tend to focus almost exclusively on the European tradition, mainly because that issued in you know, the workers' movement, syndicalism, anarcho-syndicalism, and anarchism was only part of those debates, whether that was in China, um, in Japan, wherever else, or Latin America. Those debates were part and parcel of, of very indigenous uh, experiences of exploitation and domination. There's always a local culture to, to, the, to, the, to the politics of anarchism and that, that is certainly true about non-European cultures and the way in which anarchists understood um, the ways in which different social forms might take root in different places. So that's one of the arguments that comes out in the um, discussions of the Mexican Revolution, for example. Mm -hmm. Economic, social, political and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. My Traditional constitutions always tend to divide power in some way, tend to specify the rights and responsibilities of individuals and of co collectives within that polity. And what the anarchists sought to do was to try and find their own way of doing similar things. And so the positive aspect of that, the particularly anarchist approach to it, is to say that anarchy is a core value. Now what that means exactly isn't entirely clear, but traditionally anarchy pertains to the absence of a final point of authority, which is generally anathema to con constitutions. Constitutions always have to posit either a final point of authority or, or an underlying grund norm, a norm that's supposed to galvanise and find it at the foundation for a polity. 
And when, when you think about anarchy as that underlying value, it tends to suggest, it suggests it very much re in practice means that there is no underlying value, that there is no final point of authority. And that poses a clear challenge. So how do you organise effectively in the absence of a final point of authority? Traditional political thought, constitutional theory would say that that's impossible. And anarchists demonstrate through practice, through the last 150 years or more of anarchist practice, that actually routinely anarchists organise without a final point of authority. That's not to say that traditional cultural norms around gender, um, sexuality, race and so on don't structure those groups, but anarchists are particularly attuned to those things and try and develop constitutional practices and institutional forms that work against the transmission, the cultural transmission or the historical legacy of patriarchy, of white privilege and so on. Uh, and what that looks like in practice will be, you know, infinitely varied. And I think that's the point of anarchy, that there is no one constitutional form, that there are multiple constitutional forms that ought to meet the demands of the groups that seek to realise them. And so those constitutions are supposed to to speak a people into being, to, to really to, to be that piece of doc, the document or a set of practices that, that brings a people together. And the people, of course, is not a, a national community. It's always much more plural. I think there's another aspect to this, which is um, in, in the framing of, of anarchist constitutions. So um, one of the things that anarchists have, have, historically at least, attempted to do is to avoid the establishment of a constitutional council that frames the constitution that then the people are invited or you know those would-be citizens are invited to endorse. So there's a gap always between the design of the constitution and the people who it's supposed to, to um, enable. And so anarchists want to design their constitutions collectively so the people who are involved in the process are the, are the people who are going to be members of this, this organisational group. And, and the other thing that, that has animated, at least in a practical sense, the Constitution, is the question of, of how you protect egalitarian relations in ways that are going to enable the group to survive over time and protect it against degeneracy from, from um, private accumulation or inequalities that arise through everyday practices. So what you find in historic constitutions um, is a, a set of provisions, usually, which are uh, not only sort of setting out what the what the decision-making processes will be or what the, the fundamental principles are and what the rules of the association are, but also explicitly addressing how equalities are going to be maintained and what measures uh, will protect the constitution from those principles themselves being challenged. What anarchists are trying to do to address that is, A, yes, to protect the constitutional mm. structure of the group, but also to enable as much participation mm. as possible. And that poses challenges too, obviously. But what it what what it's designed to sustain is a principle of direct democracy, uh, egalitarian participation, as much participation as possible, as a way of realizing the collective we by articulating each individual mm. I to get that sovereign I mm. to articulate, enable it to be the individual they want to be within a collective. So anarchists are primarily concerned with enabling, and I think that's, that's, um, that's quite unique. But it also harks back to very traditional ways of understanding what constitutions are for. I mean, at the heart of the Republican Constitution is this idea that, you know, making rules beneath the oak tree, you know, this mm. Genevan constitution that Rousseau had in mind. The idea was that the nation state would be able to articulate that. And anarchists always said, this is, this is ludicrous, it's never going to work, uh, and it hasn't. The, the problems of the constitution are that the anarchist has are similar to the non-anarchist, but actually what the anarchist is doing is trying to transform the reality uh, of, of all of that injustice that, it, that, that is evident to us by constitutionalising in a different way and in a way that can challenge actually those social relations. I decided to devote myself to the presentation of anarchism. So, Constitutionalising in Occupy, um, what we found when we looked at the practices of, of three Occupy camps, so Wall Street, London and Oakland, was that there were sort of four different aspects or interrelated aspects of, of constitutional process. I suppose the, the, the obvious kind of part of that is the, the actual declarative principles, so the, uh, 
the documents that bring these uh, these occupations, these camps into being. And you know, there's a there's a, a kind of a foundational moment, if you like, where uh, the, the Declaration of Occupy itself is is articulated and framed, and that then uh, provides an umbrella, if you like, for a set of principles which others can mimic and adapt mm -hmm. so that as other camps are set up across the world, actually what they do is they refer back to these principles or these hallmarks, but they set up their own statements of, of autonomy, they set up their own statements of principle, and uh, they constitute themselves around those principles. So that's, that's one of the things that goes on um, in, in the camps. The second thing is that as the camps take root, I mean, certainly the camps that survived over longer periods of time, uh, you find that, of course, institutions emerge from within the camps. So just to, to satisfy the needs of the, of, the, of the participants, you know, you've got kitchens, you've got medical services, you've got uh, tranquility teams to, to resolve conflicts, uh, you've got working groups that are set up. So, you know, you have a set of institutions, you have bank accounts, social media accounts, general, uh, assembly. uh, general assemblies, you've got archive groups, all of these things are taking place. Um, and what, what happens is that that also brings into to being a set of rules which regulate not only what they can do, but their relationship with the gender, I mean, the, the, the relationship, for example, between working groups and the general assemblies. So you have institutions, you have rulemaking, mm -hmm. Um, all of which is framed in, in the, the, um, the context of the principles. And then you also have decision-making processes. So one of the things um, that, that, that Occupy becomes very famous for is its adoption of consensus decision-making and its very participatory process, which of course was, was educative and was um, adopted uh, with, with a lot of um, discussion within the camps and a lot of... Um, trial and error, if you like, within the camps. And again, the reason that it's adopted is, is, is not, I think, because the only thing that Occupy wanted to do was to, to develop a democratic process or to demonstrate that there were different ways of making decisions to the ones in which we're used to, you know, just the, the tick box voting practices. But this was part of, a, of a, an understanding, a self-understanding of what it was to be a participatory member of that camp within the framework of that constitutional practice. So there are four kinds of elements that are all going on at the same time um, and are all interrelated and all of which um, you know, are being fed into directly by the participants. Mm. Something that we, we're spending a lot of time thinking through at the moment is about how individual camps relate to each other, how individual anarchist groups relate to each other, how different parts of the same organisation relate to each other. What makes the relationships of groups particularly anarchistic. So when you look at Occupy Wall Street, they tend to mimic, as Ruth said, right? The, the constitutional documents are things that you can adopt and you then you, you mimic the Wall Street encampment in Oakland, in wherever else it is. But what links those two things together beyond the sort of principles of solidarity, the relations of solidarity? Is there anything particularly anarchist about the ways those groups interlinked or ought there to be? Because one of the things you notice about Occupy is it was very easy to destroy. And historically, anarchists have always said that federation is the key principle that should unite groups. And if that's the case, and if there's something particularly anarchic about that, as in there is no final point of authority, so those groups don't necessarily have to congeal around Parliament, for example, but can you know congeal around a whole range of different uh, principles and practices, institutions, decision-making procedures, then, then can that be generalised? So is there a way of thinking about how anarchist groups can relate to non-anarchist groups or the ways in which non-anarchists, presumably those that want to or subscribe to generally egalitarian principles, might adopt? Can we think about federal polities in new ways that mm. don't require a strong centre to keep them together? Can we think about federalism as a normative project that has different ways of relating, mm. uh, where delegates are mandated rather than representative, for example? And or even where groups themselves operate in, in, in more fluid ways. Groups and associations can arise to meet particular needs and then dissolve again, uh, so, that so that you, you, you minimise the, the time uh, that's... The, the, that associations will exist for in order to avoid the entrenchments of mm. power. So, I mean, that's another way of thinking about uh, how you meet needs and how you meet needs effectively and how you constitutionalise in ways that don't uh, 
uh, enable associations to outlive their usefulness mm. in ways that are going to become uh, themselves dominating. And who, who are the constitutions for? Are constitutions for the individuals it, that are in the polity or is con a constitution for the groups that the individuals mm. form to give themselves an identity? Ought we to be respecting and enshrining rights at a group level? I mean, this is generally considered to be quite anathema to liberal constitutions. It's the individual is the beginning and the end of, of modern politics. But practically, anarchists always prioritise groups as much as the sovereign I. You know, the collective we is a really important element of an anarchist politics. So when we think about constitutionalising and we recognise that those groups are important, how can we find ways of linking up those groups without then mm. embedding them, without then entrenching particular forms of domination, uh, without then enabling particular groups to dominate others? Mm. And this is, you know, the, at the forefront of an anarchist politics is this constant a sociological understanding of relations of domination to society. Social and economic struggle. Philosophy which aims at the emancipation. The, the, the anarchist constitutionalizing argument is that the reason that existing constitutions ha, are flawed, fundamentally flawed, is because they require states in order to uphold inequality, structural inequality through property. But that's the problem. The state is the problem. For as long as you think that a third party has to exist in order to resolve your constitutional problems, you're always going to be entrenching domination. It's, it's inevitable. So you're not trying to democratise the state. You're not trying to make the state more fair. You're trying to anarchise constitutions in order to make the state redundant. Empirically, we, we can never really tell where the final point of authority is. What anarchists say is that we need to recognise that and then democratise so that we all collectively have control over those processes. Because the fallacy in depending most modern constitutions is that there is a final point of authority and don't worry about it, somebody else will take the decision and it'll be fine. And anarchists say that we, it's not a question of finding a new point of authority. It's about pluralising authority and then democratising so that we, we all have an opportunity to take part in those processes. But what it doesn't do is set up a centre that can then adjudicate it. Then that centre becomes the prize. It's what everyone fights to control because once you have control of that body, you are then able to dominate that process and shift, shift and change it in whichever way you choose. And anarchists, as we've just said, uh, would reject that precisely because it offers that opportunity to <clears throat> disempower. Uh, whereas what an anarchist project would be doing is to empower us all differentially within a constitutional structure that has no final point of authority. You know, anarchists are not thinking about how do you take the existing border territories and run them differently. The mm. whole point of decentralised federation is that you're challenging the constitution of those borders in the first place. Mm. So you know, fed <clears throat> anarchist constitutionalising is necessarily complex and necessarily small scale. So the point at which the anarchists you know, really part company with Rousseau is, is where Rousseau says at the beginning of the social contract, well, of course, the problem of, of, uh, of, of making an egalitarian agreement is, is the existence of the modern state. We simply can't have this participatory uh, system because it's too, you know, the, the existing states are too big. And the anarchist says, well, so break it down. Uh, and that means not just breaking it down in a kind of a you know, so we can think about different scales of, of decision making, but you're also then fundamentally altering the, the ways in which you adopt uh, decision making practice because things will take time that currently we do not have because we're working 10 hours a day or whatever it happens to be. So this is a fundamental change, which is not just about um, how we uh, decide on, on, on distributions or whatever it is that the, the politics uh, dictates. It's actually a, a, a fundamental social transformation that constitutionalising involves. You start in your workplace for most anarchists, because that's where you spend most of your time. Your workplace is the place that demands that direct participation. You know, we keep talking about sort of you know, the authority of the state that is external to us and so on. But capitalist social relations necessitate a boss. And you don't have control over your workplace, at least not historically and not practically. And so that constitutional impulse must start in your workplace. So unionising is key, 
democratizing the workplace is key uh, because that's where we spend the vast majority of our time. So that that transformative constitutionalising impulse is not about stepping away from work and thinking about politics as separate. It's actually politicising the workplace and finding that as the location where you start thinking very concretely about new ways of constituting uh, an egalitarian polity. Political and spiritual of the human race. I prefer to stick to my gun. Anarchism, 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 anarchism